Welcome, everybody, to the Inner Carnivore Podcast, episode 30. My guest today, Eddie Goki. Before I jump into that, whether you guys are streaming this on iTunes, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or watching the full video on YouTube, if you could do a huge, huge favor, like the show, comment, uh, review, rate it, uh, share it with your friends. It helps more than you guys know, and I appreciate it every single time that you guys do that. Uh, so getting into it, my guest, Eddie, um, author of the book Contraindicated, available now on Amazon. Make sure you guys go check that out. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Another busy week, but such is life, right? Correct. Yes. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so I have tons of stuff. For anybody who doesn't follow Eddie, um, very, very, very detailed into the scientific mechanisms of all things diet, um, for lack of a better term. And, and we've talked a little bit, um, done videos, watched a bunch of his stuff. Um, and I love the fact that you go super in-depth with it. Um, that's an avenue that I don't typically go, A, um, because I find that the less technical I get, the more people argue in the comments which is fine by me. <laughs> um, Engagement. And two, like a lot of people just, you know, have stuff go over their head and they'll be like, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. So I really appreciate having people that do go super into it. So that being said, how did you get to where we're at now? Um, describe the process of, of your, uh, your story on, on where we're at now. Right. So I'll try and be as expeditious as possible and efficient because my story is quite a lengthy one. Um, at 16 years old, I became symptomatic at least with a condition called hypermobile EDS or Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Now, people may have heard of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome before. It is a connective tissue disorder which has a very... There are a lot of manifestations. There are many different manifestations of the disease. Uh, typically, if people do know what Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is, they have an image in their head that may involve stretchy, elastic skin, overly elastic skin, um, hence connective tissue disorder. Mine did not manifest in my skin. It manifested in my ligaments, which are what hold bone to bone. That caused my ligaments to be extremely weak and not able to perform their job properly, which means that my bones moved around too much. Now, what does too much really mean? Um, in the body, just a few millimeters. It, it doesn't have to be that much. We all, I mean, the thing though about that is what that causes is an impingement on the surrounding nerves and arteries, wherever that bone is too mobile. Now, one can pretty well infer as how that would be damaging and painful in the case of a wrist or an ankle um, but it gets dangerous when you start talking about the nerves of the heart and the arteries of the neck, um, like your vagus nerves that innervate your heart and your neck, your phrenic nerves that are in your neck that go down to your diaphragm. All of this was a problem. It caused POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, just random blood pressure swings, depending on if I stood up or sat down, um, a very elevated heart rate um, that was, for all intents and purposes, it developed into my homeostasis. Uh, it was 130, 140, even sitting down sometimes. I couldn't go to school. Effectively, I did fall apart because I did continue going to work because I was told over and over again that, you know, it's just anxiety, Eddie, you know, not just by doctors, but by family members. So if anyone's been told that in their lives, they know that eventually you start believing them in a way. It's been said for years ad nauseum. It's just subconsciously ingrained it's like yep no it's in my head even though i knew it wasn't i kind of did at the same time think so so i kept going to work and i ran my body into the ground because i didn't know what the condition even was we we're trying to figure out what it was no idea what it was going on i had every test under the sun with no results coming back and on january 9th of 2022 my body fell apart uh, i turned my neck one way and my vision went black um that was at around, well, 18 years old. Um, so I went on leave for work and I didn't return. I ended up finding a clinic that 
treated the condition that I believed I had, which I was correct, hypermobile EDS. And I went there and they did all their diagnostic scans on me. And the main doctor there said that um, if you'd come any later, you were on your way for something catastrophic. There was word for word what he said. I can't forget something being said to me like that at 18 years old. So I am undergoing regenerative treatment with this clinic. It is an ameliorable condition. I still am debilitated. I am still disabled. But what I ended up starting to do during that time, which was a very lonely time because I was separated from my family I was and, and friends. I was staying in Florida, which is where the clinic is located, Fort Myers. And I was staying with my grandmother who had a house about an hour and a half away from there. Um, but you know how family is it's there, it's a relationship, but it's not like a friendship in many cases. So we're distant, we're living in the same house, but we're also we're really distant. So I had all the time in the world to start doing research, um, studying and reviewing of all these different things. I was doing this beforehand anyway, because I thought that my condition was characterized by diet, alterations and, and just different externalities that were relate, relating to diet. Um, and during that time, I came across Dr. Gundry, Dr. Stephen Gundry. You may have heard of him before. Um, he's the anti-lectin doctor and previous, I think, cardiac surgeon, or heart surgeon. And that did open my eyes to the fact that not all plants are your friends. Um, later down the line, I learned that Oh, really, none of them are in terms of their consumption with respect to the consumption of them. That's for that's for later. Um, then I came across Dave Asprey, um, which got me to up my animal protein intake more than I was before, which was really important for treatments anyway. We're rebuilding the st structures of my body through really painful injections, and we can get to that later if that becomes salient or relevant. Um, and then I came across Paul Saladino, as we all seem to do within the space. We get beguiled by his nonsense. Um, and that was the first time that I ever started eating meat and fruit together, which was the worst I ever felt after eating a meal. It was the first time that I ever experienced post-meal sweating, um, elevated blood pressure, red face, all that stuff. Um, now I know, now that I know more about the biochemistry behind things, I know why that was happening. And then on August 14th, 2022, during that year, I discovered Professor Bart K who I absolutely despised when I first came across him. Absolutely could not stand him. But I could not stop watching his video because I realized very quickly that what he was saying made sense. Um, then I watched another and then another, and I sent them to my my dad, actually, because we were on the same page. But he, I, he was learning things from me, basically. And I was like, check this dude out. And from then on, I did adopt the carnivorous diet. I felt better metabolically than I had ever felt before. The carnivore diet did not save me per se, because that's not what my condition was characterized by. Um, I believe that dietary input had a role to play because during my development, I was primarily vegetarian. I mean, my first hamburger I ate was at 10 years old at a Mexican restaurant. I mean, are you kidding me? Like, that's <laughs> ridiculous. I had like two bites. I mean, that, that's the development we're talking about here. So I think that it may have catalyzed it a little bit, but this is a genetic condition. Um, very clearly it is because many people my age grew up eating the same way and very, very, very rarely do they have this manifestation. So, but I do want to say that it, I do feel better than I ever have metabolically. And to get to more of what your question really was, which is how do I even know all the stuff that I do? It wasn't even really to do with the studying up to the point of discovering Bart K because I was studying the wrong stuff. I was studying the human nutrition science, uh, which isn't science at all. I talk about it in my channel all the time. It's not science. It is by definition theology. It is theory generating. And the associations that are seen are extremely vapid. Um, and I was not even – to say that I was studying it is still a reach because I still didn't know how to interpret the data. I didn't know how to, I, I was reading the abstracts. I was reading the conclusions. That's what everyone does when they pop the studies on the screen for three seconds. They don't know how to interpret the studies. I didn't know either. So what I, were, what I started doing was after I discovered Bart K and I discovered that he was a professor, I found his other platform where he has his lectures on there. And from effectively, since I couldn't move, I couldn't walk around, even in Florida, I couldn't enjoy the weather because I couldn't go outside at extreme heat sensitivity, which I'm still recovering from. All I could do was lie in my bed and do something. And I could either choose it to be 
playing video games and rotting away. Well, well, not really rotting away. I was still healing up. But or I could take control and I could study and actually learn things like take, you know, classes and all that stuff. And when I discovered that Bart was a professor, I effectively from the time I woke up to the time I went to bed was watching his lectures. That's what I was doing. And not only were I, was I watching them, I was going into my Google Docs and I was typing out entire papers like I was writing them for a class. And then I would, instead of submitting them because I'm not taking a class, I would send them to my family and friends and I'd go, hey, check this out because this is important. It's application in diet and, and health. And so I did that for a while, but then I realized, well, he only has a few lectures on his channel, on his other platform. So what do I do? So I watched more of his videos and basically inferred what sciences I should be inferring um, health implications from. Those being biochemistry, evolution, paleoanthropology, comparative anatomy, cardiovascular physiology or pathophysiology. And so I looked into taking classes for that online without having to pay because I don't have any money because I can't work. Well, luckily we live in 2024 and that's available. <laughs> And there are entire college level courses for this stuff. And I have now playlists saved where you go in through like you, re I have to relearn some high school level stuff, of course, because, you know, when you're in high school, you don't really care that much. <laughs> it's just how it is. So I have to sure. relearn the high school stuff. Um, but I'm currently doing it a little haphazardly. I'm learning like biochemistry right now, which is very clear if anyone watches my videos and then. Usually you're supposed to learn cellular biology before that. And I haven't learned cellular biology yet because most of biochemistry takes place in the mitochondrion and stuff like that. So I, I'm not, I'm not going in order, but I am learning things along the way at my own pace and it seems to be working. I get my stuff vetted afterwards with, um, Bart, I got a hold of him eventually. And so since he's been a professor for over a decade or at least was, I get my stuff vetted with him. I wish that I could get my stuff vetted with other people as well, but there doesn't seem to be too many people that are of his veracity level. <laughs> um, hopefully that changes later down the line. But I guess the last thing that I would, I would say is yes, that's how I know all the things that I do at the moment. I'm still currently learning. I don't pretend like I know everything. Maybe in my videos, I act like I do a little bit to be sensational. <laughs> um, the last thing would be that all those papers that I wrote in Florida, that's three fourths of my book. I was writing so much that I realized why don't I just put this into a book? Because this can benefit a lot of people. And so that book was released on April 1st of this year. And we're still making some tiny adjustments, edits really, because it went through a ghostwriting club that butchered my book. So it was perfect when it went in and it wasn't perfect when it went out, but it had a deadline. So it had to come out at some point. And so I tried to fix it as much as I possibly could before. But it's still safe to buy. Don't worry. You can, you can buy it. You'll get the information out of it, but that is where I am right now. I am currently trying to heal myself completely to the point where I can go back to work. And if I can make this my living beforehand, then I won't have to go back to work. And I just put more time into this helping people and helping people really take, um, it, it, I mean, trying to invigorate and empower people and make them realize that the knowledge is there. You just have to be responsible with how you learn the knowledge because there's a lot of misinformation online as well. You have to learn how to be sagacious enough to discern between what is voracious and what is not. And so that's what I try and get people to realize. And if they don't want to learn it themselves, well, that's why I'm also a talking head online. So sorry for that. Uh, well, right. that, that, that's, that's perfect. And it, it illustrates a couple of things. One, the amount of information that's out there, right? And two, how much education has failed us, right? Like, so I've on this, on this channel, I've had PhDs, nutritionists, registered dietitians, MDs, naturopathic doctors. And obviously the majority of them go against what their education was, which is mind blowing. Like, how do you have these people with such high levels of education who all had this aha moment and they're like, man, we, we were just taught wrong. And so you know, you, th that's part of the problem is if as soon as somebody puts a PhD on their, their social media, everybody goes, oh, well, we got to listen to that guy. That guy knows what he's talking about. And you're like, but does, does he really, um, you know, and I started with 
targeting dietitians because you'd get the dietitians that are like, you need this much bread in order to for your brain to function. I'm like, okay, this is like the most low hanging fruit in the history of the world. I'm just gonna like go after it because this is way too easy. And then I'm like, okay, it's I got to do something else because it's just too easy. I can literally just go on any dietitian's page, and then you know, of course, you end up with a thousand comments of people arguing. And and part of me is like, okay, how do with all this information, like you said, it's you can literally get all of the education of a degree program on YouTube, like literally all of it. And so I'm like, okay, if there's all this information, why are why are people missing things? And it's interesting you brought up the study because my best videos have literally been just looking in the middle of a study out of the conclusion. Like the one video that I had that went viral, it's up to like 1.4 million views. I literally just read the conflict of interest statement. It's literally the only thing I did. And then I matched up who was in the interest statement with what drug that they produced. And people were like, oh my gosh, that's mind blowing. I'm like, how do you I didn't do anything. I literally just read out of the study, which you guys didn't do because all you did was listen to somebody with a PhD that said, check out this consensus statement. So my point, where did we go wrong? Like at what point did we get so far away and from an education standpoint? Because it's it's rampant everywhere, like anywhere from you know first grade education up to PhD level education. How did we get so far off track as an education system given all of the stuff that you've now learned secondhand. Right. So I'm not sure exactly where it went wrong, but I do know that it happened within the, well, 20th century, the middle of the 20th century, because what ended up happening was institutions used to be conferring of credibility upon people. They used to be of the utmost, you know, once again, to use the word voraciousness. <laughs> um, and, and the thing is, is, what ended up happening, I think, is the Department of Education are not trying to get political, but what they do now is instead of the curriculum that is prevalent within schools now is not teaching people how to think anymore. It's teaching people what to think. And what ends up happening is when you do that, it's very easy to get them to immediately have the proclivity to appeal to authority immediately. So you can get to the point where authority bobbleheads can say whatever they want. Anyone at the upper echelons of authority or society can say whatever they want. It doesn't have to be correct. If you've taught people what to think and not how to think for themselves, you now have a very beguiled population. Um, that are enticed by fancy words that you've also, you know, gotten them to not understand by diluting the the curriculum. You get people don't know how to speak anymore. <laughs> that's also something, you know, that's that's part of being able to think. There's no difference between thinking and writing, for example. And I think that is highly associated with what we see today, which is a bunch of erroneous claims being made within the within universities. Um or by people that have gone to university. And that that's why you have people now that just depend on getting initials, a little extra initials after their name in order to make it to where they can say whatever they want and have people believe them. And so I noticed that, I mean, even whenever I was growing up with the help of my father who brought that to light, I mean, I was a kid thinking the same. I mean, kids are really, that's, that's what happened. You, you, look at the, you look at the news and they say something happened. It's like, well, then that must be what happened. My dad was the one that was really, he inculcated that sagaciousness into me and said, hey, look, son, <laughs> um, this is not, don't listen to just what the words being said to you are. You have to look at all these other factors. And so I noticed it early on, but I was still, because it's one thing to say that they're all wrong, but it's another thing to actually give someone guidance afterwards. I mean, you can say that everything, you can tear down the structures and say, okay, well, everything's just wrong. If you don't give someone afterwards a place to go, they're just lost. And so that was where I was. I was like, well, then what do I do? <laughs> I don't understand that. And that's what also makes people that go against the grain enticing, even if they are also wrong. Paul Saladino is one of these people. He goes against the grain. He goes against the mainstream uh establishment uh, narrative enough to the point where he seems enticing to the people that have woken up like we have. 
but he's still wrong. And so I was in that stage. That's why I came across people like Stephen Gundry, Dave Asprey. And then when I came across Bart, that was what established order back in. That's what happened. And it got me to be like, okay, well, now I have someone that has done the science himself um, in multiple different fields. So what I can do is I can take these college level courses, write down notes, anything that seems a little off, like part of the mainstream narrative. And that happens plenty in biochemistry. You'd think it wouldn't because it's a hard science. It's kind of hard to mess that up. Except right. they'll still tell you that glucose is your primary energy source, blah, blah, blah. So I'll, I'll write down notes like that, and then I'll get it vetted further. So I learn the mainstream stuff, which 80, 90% of it could be correct. They just have to spin it sometimes, and that's all that's enough sometimes. And then I'll get it vetted, and that was my formula. I discovered that formula, and I went, okay, well, here we go. And I'm still operating under that formula. I'm still utilizing it. And um, I do that with biochemistry. I do that with many other sciences. Now I found someone that has statistical experience of 15 plus years that I'm talking with now that is based in the UK, who is teaching me how to properly interpret uh, the studies that you cite on your on your videos as well, like like the raw data set, which isn't mm -hmm. listed on the front page. And that is also something that I've wanted to do for a while, because even though I very perfunctorily dismiss it on my channel, Whenever they bring up studies like this, because of the fact, the absolute fact that it is theological, we can infer from hard sciences, which is far more credible, and you can make far more judicious inferences from those sciences because of their innate, intrinsic, experimental um, essence, as opposed to, well, human nutrition science, again, to put it in quotes, because you can't do experiments like that in that field. Um, even though I do that in my videos and it's really easy to do so based on that principle, I'd like to actually play the children's game, let's say. You know, it's it's one thing to dismiss it because it's child's play, but I need to know how to play it anyway. And so I'm learning that currently. Um, and anyway, that was a little tangential. But yes, the, your question was, you know, why, where did it go wrong? And that's what I think went wrong. The teaching of people of what to think not how to think, therefore subsequently resulting in this proclivity to appeal to authority always, which is what you see in 2024 more than you really ever did throughout history um, in, in America. We were, we were founded by a distrust in, in government <laughs> and authority. So it's like, wow, what a way to do a 180 degree turn there. But yeah. Yeah. And I, I think we, to your point, especially about the the data and the statistics. So the the LDL study, right? The the consensus statement from the European Ethics Growth Society. That is, and this this one's really hard to wrap my head around when you try and tell people. That is the one study that I think is probably the most convoluted and hard to dissect. It's not even really a study, right? It's a an opinion from a panel. It's an opinion. And if I can, if I can interject just for importantly yeah. for any viewers, uh, that they established, quote unquote, established causal relations between LDL and heart disease, except they said it fit the causal criteria, the causal criteria being criteria they made up in the study. They made up their yes. own criteria that they then said was causal and would confer a causal relationship and then said that their study fit their model. That's not how science is done. That is why even at the end of the study, study, it says in the top right corner of the paper, opinion. It, it was published in the current opinion section. Current opinion. Of the European Heart Journal. <laughs> like, yeah. and, this, and people are like, oh, you just don't understand. It's the data. I'm like, okay, here's the problem with it. Good luck finding the data. Like, it, they don't just list out their data. They don't just list studies that they did. Of course not. And so... When, when you go into the, the critical review of it, which is posted um, a year later, they reference that. They're like, honestly, it's a black box. Like there's some studies that we can't find. We can't find based on their results, any study that matches that. And we can't figure out which studies they included and which studies they didn't. And the number, the thing that opened my eyes probably the most is so that, I mean, that video has like 3000 comments on it. Right. The number of people defending Pfizer being in the conflict of interest and defending the data is just absolutely mind blowing. I'm like, you can't find it. Like, I'm, I'm sure some people can, right? But it is so buried. And that's part of, part of the problem with all these meta analysis. 
is you have a meta-analysis that references another meta-analysis that references data from the 80s yep. that I can't access because all it is is this little blurb that they put up on online. And I'm sure there's some physical record somewhere, but you can't vet any of this information because there's so many layers that people literally just read the abstract because it's that's what pops up 95% of the time, right? You see the the really, the summary with an abstract and a conclusion and they go, oh, LDL causes heart disease. Boom. And that's as far as they go. And, it, and it's because they treat scientists as gods because really what they need to realize is that the conclusion, for example, is an opinion written by authors. It is an opinion. In many cases, we've seen that some scientists will actually inappropriately and incorrectly convey the results of their own study. Whether that's because of whether that's with malice aforethought because of a bought and paid for agenda, or if it's genuinely due to their own misunderstanding of what they they found, like it's just an innocent, they don't really know, they discover this new thing. That has happened multiple times. So you cannot act like these scientists are omniscient and read a conclusion and say, well, then that is what the study showed. Okay, because people lie, first and foremost. And also, people sometimes just make errors. <laughs> okay, scientists are people, like you and I. It's, it's so one of the problems with social media is that now it's like any t any person you see on social media, you in your head they're on a pedestal and they're like an authority figure and like they're gods or something. It's like you need to understand these are people, guys. Um, don't just look at a conclusion and think, well, then I mean they're scientists, so therefore it must be right. Like have some skepticism. That's in fact that is what science is predicated upon is is trying to disprove everything, and that's that's really all that science can do. It can't really prove anything. It, it can disprove things. Um, it's something that is really endemic. And it's, 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 I think, one of the reasons why you see such misinformation being promulgated today. Uh, because people just flash out a bunch of studies, the readily available nature of these, of these studies. It, it, it wasn't the case before the internet. And now you've got this whole catalog and this abditory of just this th tens of thousands of studies that you can access. And now anyone can look at it, even the most, you know, inept of people can look at these studies and then just post it online and manipulate a bunch of people into thinking that it's the truth. So that that's what you have now. And I'm trying to bring it to people's attention on my channel. Like, hey, no, <laughs> that's simple. Like, no, uh, and also trying to just get them out of this whole cesspit. Like, just okay, let me take you out of the whole nutrition science bread and circuses. Okay, let's put you into, like, the biochemistry here. And I can simplify it, and I try to do that on my channel. Like, I get into granular details, like you just mentioned. But just like what you said, a lot of people get turned off by that because if they don't understand it, then it's like, okay, well, I'm, I'm not interested. I don't understand. So I'll say some words here and there, and then I'll, like, I'll break it down. And I, I do that because... I say, hey, had anyone even brought to your attention that there's this whole other area of science that is actually able to establish causal relationships between things like metabolic pathways like this, like that, or like the Warburg effect predicated upon biochemistry? Has anyone brought this to your attention? Because, or, or did they flash a bunch of abstracts on the screen for three seconds and then tell you what they said? <laughs> That's literally what it is. And like, honestly, if it wasn't for the fact that I can download your video, not yours, but you know, an, an influencer's video and go frame by frame, half the time you won't even know what it is they're citing. Mm -hmm. Like, and so that, that's when I realized, right? Like uh, the, the video before LDL, when I realized that people just don't read studies or don't understand studies, like you said, I was like, man, I can like really get a lot of traction simply by pointing out how poor most of these studies are. Like, I don't even have to like make an opinion. Most of the time I don't make an opinion because I'm not, a scientist. I don't have a PhD. I'm not like, I understand some stuff, but I'm not one, an authoritative figure to go out and say, like, make us a, a strong opinion, except for, you know, basic physiological stuff. And so I'm like, okay, all I can do is these people with 700,000 followers, a million followers do that. And everybody goes, oh my gosh, eat fiber. It lowers your risk of, of heart disease. And so that, that was like the first one that I came across. And so I, I looked at the study and that was my my first aha moment of, wow, these studies are bad. And so I actually got Lane Norton to comment on my video. He's like, wow, you really went through some mental gymnastics. I was like, bro, I literally read the study. 
I literally read it verbatim. Lane Norton. He said, L- Lane Norton. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into Lane Norton. Okay. We'll get into Lane Norton. Okay. But I was like, I was like, dude, they said this observational study can't prove causation. Okay. They're like, it's highly unlikely that a single food group or a single nutrient is causative of anything. Okay. Mm-hmm. They're like, because of the methods of getting the information, like FFQs, you should be careful and you shouldn't put so much emphasis on the risk estimate. I was like, then what are we doing here? And then I look at the list, like they're one of the ones that actually listed all the studies. The very first one was a smoker group in the 80s from Finland. And I was like, what is happening right now? And that's literally all they did. And you have people like Lane Norton, who has a PhD. Mm-hmm. Coming on there being like, you're jumping through mental gymnastics. I'm like, I'm literally reading the study, bro. Like, I'm apparently the only one that went to the full site, like, link and actually read it. And I didn't have to interpret data. All I had to do was read what the authors wrote. And apparently nobody does that. Nope. And, and on, honestly, yeah, I don't know when you want to get into Lane Norton because I, I can make a comment on what you just said. Lane Norton right now. Yeah. He's, I've, uh, I'm, I'm waiting for something because I start getting comments from him and everybody tags him in literally everything I do. Yeah. Everything I do, I get a lane. It it is the, it is the meathead part of the fitness industry that thinks it's the more sophisticated part of the meathead industry. So there's still meatheads, but they, it's like they, they listen to lane or at bio lane. I'll always see it at bio lane, at bio lane. And I'm like, yeah, I said it in one of your recent, it was either in your reel or it was in Colt Milton's reel where it said, um, they say, they said at bio lane. And I said, quick, Tag the petulant PhD because, I mean, I call them petulant because that is (laughs) – this man, he is a man, but he doesn't really act like one online. He doesn't. And I know that's coming from someone that's far younger than him. I don't care. Okay, because it it, that's not – he picks fights with people and and also basically waves around his master's degree in – or bachelor's degree in biochemistry – like an angry road raging cop flashing his badge out the window. Like that, that that's what he does. And that's called, <laughs> that's called being petulant lane. Um, I I've done three videos on lane before I've done three. Um, one of them is exclusively on my Patreon, but the, the better one I posted on YouTube and it was just about his just absolutely arrogant, offensive behavior towards people within the carnivorous space. It was three years ago. It was three years ago and he was still doing this. And he had responded to a woman online who posted, she was in the carnivorous space. Um, and she, she posted this little sort of like an infographic and it was comparing bread to steak. And it was like, this is so many calories you burn eating through digesting bread and like all this stuff. I'm going to be really honest. I said in the video, cause I'm, I don't, I don't care about sides. I looked at the post and I was like, this is not a good post. It is misleading in ways. It is misleading. Especially when you start talking about calories, it's like many people still don't understand the whole calories issue. And I'm not saying that in a disparaging way. I'm just saying it's, it's a something that we kind of bypass in the carnivore space because the philosophy is like, well, it doesn't matter. Cause you're not going to be eating as much cause you'll be satiated. And, but we never actually touch on the actual calories issue. This, it was, it wasn't a great post, but the way in which Lane responded was also just as incorrect, if not more. He started doing a bunch of math, like actually writing down math on a notebook for 10 minutes straight. And I was like, wow. And then at the end, he was talking, he was just, he was just vituperating her. He was insulting her, saying that she was an idiot, just like everyone else in the current of her space. He's also someone that I think Anthony Chafee just brought this to the, to the table and brought this to everyone's awareness. Uh, that saw his story, that there was a cancer patient within Lane Norton's comment section on one of his videos. I don't know if it was an Instagram reel. I think it was a long form video on YouTube who said to Lane, who is someone that is not a fan of fasting. He says it doesn't matter whatsoever. They said to him, they said, hey, you should look into fasting causing autophagy, which is important for cancer because it'll eat away at deranged cells, which is true. That is that's called biochemistry. Once again, to bring it back, we know what autophagy is. We know what it does. And instead, um, Lane, basically, I believe I, I, this is speculation, but Anthony, I think had screenshots. He has receipts, um, basically told him that he should shut up, call him an idiot. 
and then got all of his fans within the comment section to bombard him and inundate him with, with insults. A can this is a former cancer patient, if not a current one. So I don't know if he fully recovered or what. Um, and then that person brought it to Anthony's attention, I believe. And then Anthony, you know, that this is the, this is the man we're talking about here. And so when it comes to Lane Norton on my channel, when I react to people, it is acrimonious. It, it's very bitter and, and pugilistic. I'm like, I'm, you know, but I'm never actually really denigrating the character per se. I'll say it in my thumbnail, like arrogant, whatever, but I don't hate these people and I don't hate Lane either. But I highly dislike him because of the way he acts. He's the one person that I'll be like, what are you doing? Why are you being, like, so insulting? And I think he's on an ego trip from hell. That's what it is. He's on an ego trip from hell. And I guess the final note that I'll add with him is I recently, the most recent thing I saw from him was a video. He was at some sort of conference, and he was talking about how, you know, the, the normal, the basic stuff where he's like, I haven't seen one study where fiber wasn't, um, that's yeah. that's the video I did. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, it was you. It, it was you that posted it. Yes. Okay. Where where he basically said that anyone and he he said it. He said that anyone that is carnivore that has eliminated fiber and has said that they increased their has has seen benefits from it or has healed diseases. He called them effing idiots. Mm -hmm. As if that was like okay, so you're going to call people idiots for removing a food group that didn't give them um, anything but distress. Good. Yeah. And it's, it's completely disingenuous because that trickles down. Like, so I've had, and, and this is part of why I started doing the podcast and started doing more like carnivore promotion stuff was because I've talked to people who have just had unbelievable life changing results from it. And so one in particular was a a gal that I had on, um, she's been on Baker's podcast, Kilt's podcast, and she was like 35 plus years of severe mental illness, severe eating disorder. Um, you know, was you know the the prototypical like skin and bones before and after, like mm -hmm. just completely wrecked her life, was in and out of mental institutions, and was continually put on these practically vegan diets. And to try and gain weight, and then she was pumped full of um, you know, high fructose corn syrup and like seed oils to help her gain weight, and it was just brutal. And then she kind of discovered on her own and started eating meat. And now eats like two and a half pounds of meat, and like it's great, and there's all this stuff. And like she's very dear to me, and I I appreciate her a lot. And people will in the comments she'll share share her story, and people in the comments will go your line. That's not true. And, I, and I'm like, man, wait, where do you think this comes from? This comes from Lane Norton calling people idiots who have changed their life from it, right? And, and the, the one that, I, that made me do the video on Lane Norton was when he said, you're only experiencing benefits because you're not bloated anymore. No. Bloating, <laughs> bloating is a manifestation of inflammation. That is what that is. It is, inflam it's, it is inflammation of the gut. That's what that is. It's also a production of excess you know, um, gas. That's yeah. what that is. But the key word there is excess because it's not necessary. <laughs> um, and then it's all predicated upon his fallacious misinterpretation or, well, his fallacious interpretation of the science that he knows so well. Um, wherein he claims, once again, in that video that you did on him, where he said that he hasn't seen one study that where fiber hasn't reduced the risk. And I'm going, well, not risk. Sorry. And, and we're already done with that because you can't say risk. <laughs> risk is a cause and effect claim. You're looking at associative data predicated upon, well, like you just said, studies that he cites where, or, or studies that he defends at least, where you're looking at a subgroup of a population in the 80s that smokes about like, like what, I don't, it, it's predicated on stuff like that. So, so no, you haven't seen studies like that. And that just evinces and demonstrates your incompetence with respect to how to interpret said science science. And that's my problem with, uh, that's the biggest problem with Lane that I have besides his attitude is within his videos, he will always claim obnoxiously that um, randomized control trials are the highest level of evidence. That's if you're referring to the hierarchy of evidence, quote unquote, that was, that is a construct necessarily by the 
com scientific community, but it's only a hierarchy within the confines of human nutrition science. So when you get out of that, that's not a hierarchy of evidence for all sciences on the face of the planet. That's a hierarchy of evidence in within the human nutrition science sphere, which is, you know, at the bottom, you've got like uh, anecdotes or like case studies or something like that. And then above that, you've got like epidemiological analyses. And then at the very pinnacle, you've got RCTs. That's why he believes that they're of the utmost um, conferring of veracity upon results. Except, no, I mean, even once again, biochemistry that I like, that I'm quite familiar with, that he likes to pretend he's familiar with because he has a bachelor's in it. I did look at his background. I, I thought it was a master's. It's a bachelor's. Fine. But this is someone that, that, has a, a, a degree in biochemistry, and yet will completely callously dismiss the role that hormones play within body composition. He will explicitly state and laugh at anyone that, that claims that hormones play a role more than calories. And that, that was the, the video I did on him recently was about calories because he doesn't understand calories whatsoever. He doesn't understand them at all, and it's one thing to understand something and to humbly speak upon something at least. Really, if you don't understand something, you shouldn't be talking about it at all. But, you know, but to, you know, once again, vituperate people about it as if you do know what you're talking about with respect to calories. Arrogance. By definition, arrogance. To believe yourself well, remotely disproportionately competent as compared to you know, disproportionately confident with respect to the little amount of competence that you have and exhibit upon something. So, yeah. So let's dive into the calories. Um, and this, this is something that's been newer for me because I understand where people are coming from in this space. Like I, I'm from that space. I'm from the fitness. I'm mm -hmm. from, you know, athletics, from amateur bodybuilding. And I'm someone that's been able to manipulate calories to my benefit. And then I started to realize that once you're metabolically healthy, you can pretty much do whatever the heck you want and still lose weight. Like, and, and you start looking at athletes, like people have this idea that athletes spend billions of dollars and some do like Russell Wilson spends, you know, $10 million on his nutrition and recovery and all that. But then you have guys like David Wells, for anybody who doesn't know David Wells, David Wells, one of the better pitchers in major league history through a perfect game, still drunk from the night before. Right? So it's like, you know, and you, you got athletes that stay out till three o'clock in the morning doing cocaine and then have, you know, historic performances the next day. Athletes are built different. Athletes can get away with whatever they want for the most part. And they're not who we should look to for nutrition information. And so I, I started to realize that. I'm like, man, like, I've just benefited from the fact that I was able to overcome all this stuff. So for, from a layman's term, from a general population, what's your view on the, on the whole calories, calories in, calories out, calories, a calorie energy balance model of obesity. Okay. So the energy balance model is a very poor model of metabolism. And saying poor is actually an understatement because it is predicated once again on a fallacy that the human body can even consume calories to begin with. A calorie, basically calories are the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water around a closed thermodynamic system, also known as a bomb calorimeter by one degree Celsius. It's a measurement of kinetic activity, movement of the molecules in that water. And that movement being caused by photons of a certain wavelength interacting with the surrounding water after being released from the rapid combustion of a food within that bomb calorimeter via a massive electrical current. Okay, so in order to be informal, because that was technical, to be informal, there are units of heat energy. And even that is technically a reach because to say that it is a unit means that you measured it and you can't measure energy, but whatever. Inf it is a unit of heat energy. And here's the thing about the human body. The human body does not absorb energy. It absorbs mass or matter, something real and tangible. What happens with respect to metabolism is your body will absorb mass in the forms of carbohydrates, fats, proteins, alcohol. Those are really your four types. 
it chemically interacts those substances under control with molecular oxygen. They react in such a way so as to change the chemical bonds around. And since those reactions are exothermic, meaning they release heat as opposed to endothermic, meaning they require heat to effectuate the process, some calories are released to entropy of the body. This is why we have body heat. As we sit here and we speak, we are releasing calories. That is true. Now, is that the same thing as burning calories? I have a problem with the terminology, but just for, just for conceptualizing model. Okay, conceptual model. Sure, you're bur we're burning calories right now as we speak. Okay. But a large portion of that energy is encapsulated by the body to create ATP. Okay, and then that energy can be released because ATP itself isn't energy. It's a storage form of it. It can be released for metabolic processes when indicated. Okay. Now, the reason why this is important, because people will, may, may think, okay, Eddie, you just went through all of that nonsense, which may not have been nonsense at all, but the application is still the same. Eat less and move more. It's just you're not eating calories. You're eating mass. False. Here's why. Calories are all the same. They're all the same. Technically speaking, a calorie technically is a calorie. There's no difference in calories. When you say mass, that raises the necessary query. What mass are we talking about? Are we talking about an amino acid? Because there are differences in mass. There's amino acids. There's protein. There's fatty acids. I'm sorry, amino acids are protein, but whatever. There's carbohydrates and there's alcohol. All these things affect the body differently. What do I mean by affect the body differently? Well, they all have different impacts on Drum roll, please. Hormones. All of them have different impacts on your hormones. The way in which your body decides to expend that mass, store that mass, recycle it, etc., whatever the body decides to do, is dictated on hormones. Insulin and glucagon being the primary ones. But even hormones like epinephrine have a role to play. Testosterone, estrogen. All of these hormones have, have roles to play. Cortisol. And so that's why I try and get people to understand that you don't eat energy, you eat mass, because saying that may seem like, it may seem like trivial semantics and legomachy. It's not because it raises the necessary query of what type of mass you are talking about. And then just to add a final note, just for fun, the first law of thermodynamics that is incessantly cited usually is not cited as the first law. They just say the law. And I go, there's not one law. What are you talking about? There's four. There's four laws. And then also, just for fun, if you ever told them to number them, they'd probably say one, two, three, four. It's zero, one, two, three. There's the zero <laughs> law. Yeah. So, but I, I don't even go that far. I go, okay, okay, okay. So the law of thermodynamics, which one are you citing? Okay, they're citing the first one. What does it say? That's the next question you should ask them. And Lane Norton was someone that says mass cannot be created or destroyed was what the first law of thermodynamics said. Mass is explicitly excluded from the law because it's not involved. Mass is not involved with closed systems. So right there, that was already wrong. Not to mention the fact that mass is not conserved in all circumstances. But um, what I say is, okay, so it's a formula. It says delta U equals Q minus W. The change in internal energy of a system equals the quantity of energy supplied to that system minus the work done by that system. Okay, that is exclusive to closed systems. The human body is an open thermodynamic system. What does that mean? It means that not only do we allow for the flow of energy in and out of the system, like closed systems do as well, but also the flow of matter, something real and tangible, like water vapor, like carbon dioxide, like sweat. All urine, fecal matter, all these things play into this. And so, no, it is not calories in, calories out. You cannot consume a calorie. They, they don't have a rest mass. They can't be brought to rest, so therefore they have no mass. Anything that has no mass cannot affect the mass balance of the body, up or down. So even though we're expending calories right now, we're releasing them. That's not affecting our weight. Not one bit is that affecting our weight. So... I know that that was lengthy. That's kind of how I am. I kind of got to get used to I, I got to get better at not being like that. But I no, hope that's that totally fun. all of the information that is is required. I mean, I can go deeper into it if people want to. They can ask me that later. They can email me and, you know, that'll probably be listed at the end. But that is that is what 
I try and get people to understand. I've done plenty of videos on them when I where I debunk Sean Nalawani, who is another one that you may recognize, um, mm -hmm. who says the same thing. And, and the other problem with calories when you use the terminology calories is since calories are all the same, you get inane philosophies like Sean Nalawani's wherein he says, and he explicitly said this, this is a very old idea as well. It's where the whole cutting and bulking thing came from outside of the context of, of competitions. Um, Sean said explicitly that you can take stored calories in your fat cells, not a thing. You can take stored calories in your fat cells and use those calories to build muscle. You can't do that because that's not how it works. But the reason that it, it's like when you use calories, it has unintended consequences like those philosophies, because since all calories are the same, if you believe them to be stored, then of course it would be completely sensible in that respect to believe that calories from fat can be used towards muscle because they're all the same and that all your structures are made of stored calories. And so I, I can't stand the word itself with respect to human nutrition. So the solution, if people are wanting a solution is like, okay, the, what word do we use? Use a mass unit, like grams, kilograms. It's really, it really is that simple. Like how many grams of, how, how much did you eat today? Don't use the calories term, like how many calories, but use the mass, like kilo, how many kilograms or grams of food did you eat? And people may have to get used to seeing that number because it's much easier to like look at the calorie number instead, but it is going to be more truthful um, and more congruous with reality. So final, well, final I, question or final answer. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, and I love playing devil's advocate with it because I, I will tell people, and so on purpose, I'll say calorie is not a calorie. You know, well, yes, it is to you to you know, measure. Look at me the exact same. And I'm like, man, I, mean, I appreciate you didn't think I knew what that was, Um, which is hilarious to me. Like people do, I'll have like 50 people post the exact same thing. I'm like, okay, like we'll be honest, bro. Um, but, th but then I'll go, okay, I'm like, cool. So, and I, I did a video on firewood. I was like, here's firewood. This has the same number of calories as this steak. And I'm like, no, it's not the same thing. Okay, why? Yeah, they'll say, yeah. Because we're talking about food. Yeah. I'm like, there, there's nothing about food in the definition of a calorie. Mm -hmm. That doesn't play into it. And like, but we, you all know we're talking about that. And I'm like, okay, well, if that's what we're talking about, then you, you still can't say that because if that's the route you want to go, go eat 2,000 calories of sugar pure table sugar, and then go eat 2,000 calories from steak and tell me they're the same thing. And they're like, oh, well, it's a unit of measurement. I was like, then firewood's the same as steak. I'm like, well, you can't. No, because we're talking about food. And so I, I was like, you know what? I'm going to play into that. I don't even know if I technically agree with this, but I'm going to be a little inflammatory. And so I posted uh, Friedman's um, philosophy on a calorie is a calorie is a violation of the, defies the second law of thermodynamics. So that <laughs> And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna do. What? I'm gonna say this in the least understandable way possible, in the most scientific way, and just watch people lose their minds. And the number of people who confuse that with the first law, they're like, calories in, calories out is is still a thermodynamic principle. And I'm like, I'm not even talking about that. Like it's it's so. And so then my my comeback to all of it, and it's always the same thing. I'm like, okay, how can a natural law of energy, which has no mass, dictate fat storage in the human body? Like, what's the mechanism that thermodynamics stores fat? Yeah. And the people are like, it's really, well, yeah, right there. Actually, that was probably your best refutation right there. Because as soon as you start saying that, like the law of thermodynamics, how, does it, it, how is it involved in the role of storing fat? Those are completely opposed to each other. Fat is mass. <laughs> Therm, thermogenics relates to heat. You know, not everything is made of heat, guys. You know, it's, it's like, it's like, that's the thing about energy. Energy has different manifestations. So, but we'll take heat because that's what's involved in the body when it's released. It's like, okay. So this fatty acid that you're consuming from your food. Okay. There's energy stored in the bonds, but if those aren't released, then you're talking about mass. We're done. I mean, really what you get, what you got to think as well is like the calorie number on food labels. I'm not even going to mention the 20% plus or minus error. Well, I guess I just did, but you know, like that, I'm, I'm not even going to really spend time on that. Let's say it's 100% correct. That is not how many calories are in that food. When people say like, oh, how many calories are in that food? I go, well, zero. There's not, there's no calories in a food. That's the amount of calories would, that would be yielded if you combusted the food in a bomb calorimeter with the philosophy that that's what the body somehow does with food, which it's not. 
But what happens though is when you when you eat the food, it's broken down into the mass constituents, and then it's it's flown through the blood, like I was just explaining. And yes, there's energy contained within those bonds. But you gotta think. E equals mc squared. The amount of energy within something equals the mass of that something times the speed of light squared. And just to do a little Google search, like right now, if you wanted to, the speed of light is hundreds of millions of miles an hour. So now take that mass unit, multiply it by the speed of light squared, and that's how much energy is contained within the mass that you're that you're talking about. So that's how much energy is within your food. Okay, now if you ate all of that and your and your body broke down that mass into energy, like they're claiming, you would be effulgent. You would like little, yeah, exactly. And, and so it's it's like you don't yield energy from food, and that's another thing that oh man, you say that online, the amount of comments that I get, the amount of comments. I had someone that was that was ostensibly familiar with quantum physics arguing with me. He didn't even know anything about diet. He had just come across it because I tagged the whole calories thing in the tags in the show notes. And so he came across it and he said, he said, he was arguing with me about how you yield energy from food. And I go, well, you can sort of make that claim. You can say you indirectly do because energy is yielded and released after the reactions that occur within the body. But those are chemical reactions. You don't actually break down the food into energy directly. That's not what happens. Because I just explained what would happen if you if you did that, and they don't really seem to quite understand it, uh, or they are just purposely obstinate to the point where it's not only it it's no longer obstinance; it is perverseness. You are purposely doing it because you cannot admit via your pride, um, or due to your pride th that you are being shown up by your own. Feel like within these principles within your own field. Um, not to not to get too uh, you know, rude, but you know, it's just it's just it's just frustrating though because the arrogance online is ridiculous, and yeah, you do lose your hum humanity a little bit online. But I mean, the exhibition of arrogance can still be controlled, and I expect it to be controlled. And when it's not controlled, I I feel like I have the right to to come back at you and and snap like a little bit because I'm like 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 to bite back. It's like it it's indicated at that point, but. Yeah, the whole calories issue, I'm tired of the word. I, I don't think, I, I go as far to say on my videos, they should be removed from food labels. They don't do anything. In fact, all they do is fear monger people. They fear people into into eating uh, a lot at all. I, I think it fuels eating disorders because if you believe that it's all about calories, then you're going to get people to start naturally eating less. And then if they eat something that is like 200 calories or something, and they only eat 200 calories in a day, and they eat that food, and they still gain weight, that'll still cause them to, to eat even less. I mean, it, it's, it's a problem. And so, like, my girlfriend was a victim of that, actually. Um, she is someone that – we she's been on carnivore for a while now. We're seeing some stagnation. She, she was overweight when I met her. When we put her on carnivore, 20 pounds was lost very quickly. We're in a stagnation episode because she still is getting over this this eating problem that she used. To, she had an eating disorder. She was eating, and I, I we lived together even before we started dating. That's a long story. It was circumstances called for it, and so I saw what she ate. Like I, I lived with her, and I knew where she went. I saw what she ate, and it was nothing. She wouldn't eat anything. Guess who still remained overweight? Her. It's because it's not calories in, calories out, guys. It's not as simple. But I can go on and on about it. I will stop talking about it now. It, it's a, it's a, yeah. All right. No, it, we'll have to do something like, we'll have to do something specifically on it because it is, what I have found is people cannot wrap their head around it. So then they fall back to the energy balance model and that it's thermodynamics and then they conflate weight gain with weight loss. And it's just, it turns into just this absolute dumpster fire of a conversation. And I'm just like, yeah. Oh my gosh. But, where can people find you? Where can they find your book? Um, touch on your book just just real quick before we before we end this. Yeah, I'll, I'll touch on the book first. So so the book is called Contraindicated: A Closer Look and Revision of Mainstream Health Axioms That Have Perpetuated Illness, Disorder, and Disease for Over a Century. It is available on Amazon in paperback, hardcover, and ebook options. I'm currently working on the audiobook myself. I'm all about authenticity. I do all of my work in editing myself. I'm one man. This is a one man job which includes recording the audiobooks well. So I, I actually, I sit in my car since it's an insulated area 
So it's like a, it's like an insulated room and I record it in there. Um, but I have to edit that. I've, I've finished recording it. I have to edit it. So the audiobook will be available as soon as possible. It basically just goes through. It's a clean slate. Just like I alluded to in the beginning, you tear everything down, but people are, are still left wondering, like, where do we go now? You've torn down all the lies and all the, the, the edifices and the structures, the ideological structures that people operate under. So what do you do after that? Well, that's what the book goes under, goes over. So at first it's going through, it's just eviscerating the whole scientific in, in like 10 pages or so. Chapter one is, is called looking at science differently with the word differently crossed out. And it says properly. And it's, it's, it goes through just a very quick, brief little evisceration, really, of human nutrition science as we know it. And then the rest of the book is looking through how to actually derive what is indicated for human physiology with respect to diet and lifestyle. And I try to simplify it as much as possible. There are a few complicated parts. I think the, the one that I'm thinking of right now is in chapter two. It's a biochemistry section. And it's hard to simplify it really because it's biochemistry, but I did want to go through it still. And so, yeah, that is available. Um, and I do recommend that people buy it, not just because I get a quick buck, you know, give me all your money. No, uh, but it is, it is because of the fact that I think a lot of people just need the clean slate. Okay. We're, 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 we're entrenched still in this cesspit, like I talk about in this bread and circuses nonsense. So I, I think that people just need a refresher. Uh, to clear the confusion and also to take control of their health, of course, as as cliche as that is. But yes, um, and then also in terms of in terms of what else I'm doing right now. So that's the book. Where people can find me, I am on YouTube at e .goki underscore is the tag, like the the username. But if you look up Edward A Goki, G O E K E, that is where you will find me on there. Um, I'm a very inchoate developing channel. Uh, but I'm growing pretty rapidly. It's pretty nice to see. But um, that's where I do a lot of reaction videos to people that don't know what they're talking about. Uh, and also do some interviews. But recently, I I've had an interview with Colt Milton. And I have two interviews on the channel. Uh, no, I think three now with Bart K. Um, so I'm trying to get other people on the channel, though. I'm just branching out with the interview thing. Um, and then on Instagram, I'm at e.goki underscore as well. On TikTok, I believe that I'm also at e.goki underscore. I don't really post on those platforms right now, and I probably won't post on TikTok anymore because within the span of a month, I had gotten community strikes, which was expected. I didn't really – if my account gets shut down, it gets shut down, whatever. But um, – and then Twitter. That's an – well, X, formerly known as Twitter. That is very important. I think people should follow me on there because I post my YouTube videos on there uh, but on Twitter format. So if I – it's to hedge against any potential – threat of me being banned or shadow banned on YouTube. If people follow me on Twitter, they will still find those videos. They will still be able to watch them. And then the last thing that I'll say is Patreon to get exclusive content. Uh, one week early uploads and one extra video per week. I post three videos per week, only two make it to YouTube each week. So if you want to subscribe there, there's $2 a month tier, a $5 a month tier, and an $8 a month tier. And that helps support me as well. The goal right now is to move down to Florida to expedite my treatments because I live in Illinois, and so it's a – we take back ways as well for for safety reasons with my condition. It's, again, long story, and so it's like an 18-hour drive. It it It's not feasible. I can't fly on planes. So trying to make enough money to move down there, uh, it's a slow process, but, yeah, that is where people can find me. So <laughs> I appreciate you being on. Um, I would highly recommend, uh, especially just due to the fact that you get, you get a different look. Um, most of social media and – myself included is quick hitters designed to get people talking. And, and if you want more information, it's, it's always good to have a source to go a little bit further in depth. I uh, appreciate everybody listening, like subscribe, share it with your friends, and we will see you guys next time.